Tom Wolf come on and talk a lot about uh, uh, maximizing your efficacy of your of your weed control uh, in terms of managing your equipment and your your sprayer tips and that kind of thing, uh, getting the maximum efficacy out of your product and and minimizing any drift issues. Uh, so that was really focused on uh, getting getting the best weed management that you can. This year we thought we'd, we'd take a slight, slightly different tack and talk a little bit about the next step after those herbicide applications are made. How do you evaluate uh, the quality of your weed control program? How effective was it? Are there any particular weed issues showing up? And so uh, we've invited Clark Brenzel. He's the provincial specialist for weed control with the SASC Ministry of Agriculture. Um, and he's going to uh, going to walk through scouting, following your your, your herbicide applications, um, and tips for looking for a few things. Uh, one reason we focused on this today was uh, uh, with the recent finding of uh, glyphosate resistance in Kosha in Alberta. That's really brought the whole issue of weed resistance back to the forefront. And so uh, Clark will offer some tips in terms of identifying potential weed resistance issues and then how to manage those going forward. But also with our tight rotations and uh, high frequency of canola and a lot of rotations, if growers tend to favor a particular uh, herbicide system in those tight rotations, certainly it can shift the weed spectrum to some tougher to control weeds. And so um, Clark's going to offer some tips on in terms of scouting and what to look for and what might be the red flags that it's not just an efficacy issue related to either the weather or the uh, the application and maybe uh, something to do with resistance that, that may need a little more aggressive management. And then he'll also talk a bit about uh, management going forward for any of those issues that you might find through your scouting. And as well, uh, it's been a challenging season for spraying, so there are still some late weed our herbicide applications going on on some fields. So uh, we've asked him to touch a little bit on uh, the pros and cons of those late applications and, and uh, how best to manage those as well. So with that, I'll get Ali to uh, switch presenters and turn it over to Clark. OK, thank you, Duran. Uh, thank you, everybody that showed up today for our webinar. Um, I appreciate that uh, it's a busy time of year, so everyone taking uh, time out of their their busy schedules to attend is uh, really uh, really positive to see. And uh, I'm glad that you're looking at uh, at this presentation as being useful for you. The subtitle that I put on of what uh, Derwin mentioned here today is: Did I do anything wrong? And is there anything that we can do to fix that? So uh, to start out, and I'm just moving my box around here so that I, it's kind of out of the way for me to see. Uh, why do we want to evaluate uh, what's going on after our herbicide spraying? Um, completely separate from weed control, there may be fertilizer deficiencies that are showing up at that same time. There may be some diseases showing up on the crop at that time. Uh, when we go out and do some looking around, we may find some environmental injuries such as frost damage or other, uh, um, other damage that can be caused by environmental conditions. Um, you may want to make a submission to your crop insurance uh, for any damage that you're seeing out there. Uh, you may have a herbicide performance complaint or claim and whether that is uh, performance of the herbicide or uh, the tolerance of the herbicide, then uh, that's something that you want to know right away as well. Uh, the other thing that often happens at the, right around the time of herbicide applications and um, the follow-up from herbicide applications is herbicide carryover. And we, in the past, have done some work on this, um, looking at is it just herbicide carryover, is it just the herbicide spray I made just now, or is it something that's referred to as stacking? And by and large, what we found is that the herbicide carrier tends to 
express itself at the same time as the in-crop spray. And so as a result, it leads us to think that the combination of those two has caused the problem when actually it's often just restricted to that, that soil activity. Uh, and as Derwin said, uh, we'll be looking at uh, the concept of herbicide resistance as well as uh, at making uh, second application decisions. So scouting after weed control, you would uh, use a standard pattern, as you see on the right-hand side, that's uh, what they refer to as an inverted W pattern. Um, it's simply just a zigzag through the field. Each one of those arms of the, the W is roughly two to 300 feet, uh, so 10 or 20 paces between each of those dots, and make some observations at each one of those dots. I don't think you have to worry about getting down on your hands and knees and counting out the number of uh, weeds that happen to be in a particular area, uh, but I think you can do a very quick visual uh, I, indication of what's going on in that field um, without really doing a formal count. And what you do need to do, however, is have a, a clipboard with you or some other recording tool and record what you're seeing at each one of those locations so that you can kind of look at those afterwards and decide what kind of re remedial action that you might have to take and if you have to find uh, that spot again for submitting samples then uh, you can go right back to that spot as well. While you're doing this scouting for the performance of your weed control activity you may also want to be looking for insects and diseases as well because it's right at that point where uh, you'll be looking to the future for some of those fungicide and insecticide applications and you'll be able to see the early stages of some of those pests developing in your crop. So it's, it's a good time to get a head start on uh, scouting for those as well. Well first off we'll talk about uh, what Duron referred to as far as should I make a second application of my herbicide yeah, in crop. And we, what we should do is keep in mind that um, most of the weed control or most of the, the yield loss as a result of weed competition with canola happens within the first four leaf stages. And beyond that, the, the return from an application drops very quickly. And that isn't specific to residual herbicides like those that are in the clear field system but also non-residual herbicides that you see in the Liberty Link and Roundup Ready system also exhibit that, uh, that characteristic. What it is is just strictly a function of uh, the interaction between the crop and the weeds uh, in the field and how they respond to the presence of the other in the field. This is just a general um, indication of uh, what the impact of um, weeds are uh, and their relative emergence compared to the crop and don't take too much uh, focus on the numbers on the right, they're just there for illustrative purposes. It's not, not the exact yield loss that would be there for, the, for canola but what it is, it's uh, just an indication of the trend that's occurring and that weeds that are emerging well before the crop are the ones that are going to cause the greatest yield loss and those that are emerging roughly a week to 10 days after the crop really have no impact on, on yield whatsoever. So we have to kind of keep that in mind as well when we're deciding whether we want to make a second application. So our decision to spray. Um, there's uh, lots of studies out there looking into the critical period of weed control for canola and really what they show is that canola needs to be kept free uh, of weeds up to the four leaf stage to get the maximum yield but beyond that point there's less benefit from weed control so are we making a, a good investment and are we going to get a return on our on our investment in herbicide if we go into that crop again. The crop value has a big impact on whether you uh, invest more in that crop as well. If you've got a very high crop value then what happens is that smaller yield losses have a larger financial impact. So you, when crop prices are high you may want to consider uh, a smaller yield loss as significant and go in with that, that application. Crop stage is very important. Um, 
contrary to common belief, herbicide tolerant canola varieties are only tolerant. They're not resistant. And they're only tolerant within a certain stage. And when you go beyond that stage, you increase the risk of injury greatly uh, to that crop. So that's uh, something that, that we should keep in mind. Um, I know that we've visited fields in the past uh, where uh, folks have made late applications in those fields and uh, what they've done uh, is injured that crop and seeing the injury later uh, thought it was uh, drift from the neighboring area. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a bit of, a, bit of a, a challenge because group 2 injury and glyphosate injury look very much alike. The other problem with late application that we need to keep in mind is that the later we go in the crop, the greater the risk of uh, herbicide residues remaining in the seed uh, at harvest. And if we exceed some of those import and export tolerances, uh, we may have a crop rejected by uh, those that are buying it. And people are looking for those things more and more um, in our export markets. Um, as we said, if the crop is well ahead of the emerging weeds, there's virtually no yield penalty. Really what you're looking at at that point is, uh, are you looking at harvest obstructions and are you going to improve uh, getting th the ability to get through that crop at the end of the year and uh, get it taken off without a lot of obstructions or uh, weeds getting in the way of, of that operation. And if they're merging with the crop, say you've done a very, very early application, which is probably something that's recommended with canola, and you've gone 10 to 14 days, and you're getting to the end of that leaf staging, maybe into the four to six leaf stage, and you've still got very high weed densities, then that may be something that you want to look at uh, making a second application. And again, being sure to get it within the, the leaf staging to maintain uh, absolute tolerance. And if you have perennial weeds that uh, escape control the first time, then yes, go back again, particularly with uh, glyphosate tolerant crops. Uh, when we go in after uh, herbicide applications are made, uh, these surveys that we've done uh, from time to time in Western Canada uh, are all pretty consistent about the, the weeds that are there um, after that herbicide application has gone through and are still surviving and is still uh, present in that crop. And this is the top 10 and it varies, the top five very, uh, very little between location, between crops, um, and uh, between provinces. Uh, they're all very, very consistent, uh, the, the, cre the plants that are in that top five. Um, there is a little bit more variance in the ones that are in the, the 6 to 10. Uh, the other thing to note there is the asterisks on those weeds. Those are the ones that we've seen that are exhibiting resistance out there currently. And so that may also have some impact as to why those uh, crops are, or those weeds are present after uh, the herbicide application has been made. So. The other, uh, the other thing that we uh, would be looking for uh, in our crop is if our crop is suffering from uh, any kind of damage. And so what we can do is go out there and scout and, and if we see damage, uh, there's a few things that we need to note uh, when we're taking our notes, uh, is that we need to look for patterns and could that be related to uh, herbicide applications either uh, before or uh, after emergence. Uh, or is it related to the seeding and fertilizing operations? Because oftentimes uh, we'll see those symptoms running in strips in the field or out at the headlands or, or things like that. Uh, or is it in connection with, with a water run? Is it in connection with high spots or low spots in the field? Uh, a lot of those things can give us lots of clues as to uh, what the source of the problem might be. Look at the symptoms. Uh, Symptoms can often overlap between uh, disease symptoms, fertility symptoms, environmental damage symptoms uh, can overlap greatly 
And so that means that we need to do a little bit of detective work um, when we have uh, problems showing up in the field. Uh, check your records and make sure that you you have good records to refer back to. Um, I'm not sure about uh, those of you that are listening, but I know my memory is, is pretty good, but it's usually pretty short. So uh, I rely on notes and uh, to keep track of the things that I've done and uh, make sure that I have something to refer back to. Is it drift? It may be something that, that has nothing to do with what you've done, uh, but it may be uh, what the neighbor has done. And so if it's limited strictly to the edges of your field, that's a pretty good indicator that it is drift. It may not necessarily be a guarantee. There are a few key things, edge of the field, uh, fingers reaching out into the crop to show uh, the movement in the wind, things like that are all pretty good indicators. And also, if it, there's damage in your field, there's also likely to be damage to uh, the plants that are growing between your field and the source of the potential drift. So keep those in mind as well. If we want to look at uh, the symptoms that are out there, um, if we're looking at systemic herbicides, oftentimes what you'll find is that the older leaves uh, will initially be relatively unaffected. Um, for most, uh, most of those systemic herbicides, there are some that will uh, still cause some problems. Uh, and it's the newest growth that is affected. And whether that's from a hormone influence or whether that's from um, a, a deficiency of some kind that's caused by the herbicide, uh, then you'll see that in the newest tissue first. And then after a period of time, it will uh, expand to uh, the, uh, the older tissues and the, the plant will continue to decline. If you're looking at contact herbicides, you're looking for those uh, those very uh, uh, very distinctive um, uh, characteristics that are um, uh, found with spotting on the the leaves. Uh, sometimes you can find uh, the margins being burned off and uh, things like that that uh, that can cause some problems as well. So those that's what you would look for with a contact herbicide. Uh, so those, these are some fairly typical symptoms that you'll see. The other reason that you'd be scouting is to make sure that your herbicide performed the way that you expected. And if it didn't perform the way you expected, why didn't it perform the way you expected? Um, if we want to look at uh, fairly significant patches of weeds that are remaining in the field, um, it is possible that it could be resistance and it could be potentially a spray miss for whatever reason. Uh, we can get spray misses not only for misapplication in the field, but we can also see it if you're going through the field and for whatever reason uh, a boom end pops up in the air and you'll get that little random miss happening from time to time in the field as well. Uh, with uh, guidance that's around these days and a lot of folks are have guidance in their sprayers now to uh, to maximize their coverage and, and minimize their cost for coverage and minimize the overlap. Uh, we often don't see too many uh, real distinct misses anymore uh, with potentially the exception of nozzle blocks. And uh, when you have a nozzle block, it'll be a very distinctive pattern. And we'll see that in a second. So if you have a geometric pattern uh, to your weed patch in the field, you've got sharp defined edges, you've got straight boundaries, and, or maybe you've got parallel lines the width of the sprayer wheels in the field, then you can pretty much guarantee that it had something to do with, uh, with the application itself. But if you've got patches out there that don't have particularly sharp lines, um, you've got um, boundaries that are, that are variable, uh, you may show a general pattern that follows, uh, say, something like a combine or uh, a tillage implement in the field where uh, you'll have your main patch and you may have fingers coming out from that patch uh, to some degree. Uh, those would be consistent with resistance as well because you've got your combine moving, uh, moving seeds uh, throughout the field. Um, are there more than one species in, in that? 
that uh, patch of weeds, or is it just one single species of weed that, uh, that has escape control? And if it is one single species, it's more than likely that it's resistant. Um, if you have multiple species in that patch, it's more than likely that it was a miss of some kind or a failure of the herbicide to perform. Uh, it's next to impossible to have uh, more than one species at a time develop resistance in the field. This is a good example out of Australia of a resistant weed patch. This is um, uh, rigid ryegrass in, uh, in a cereal crop in Australia. And what you can do is you can see where the, the boundaries of that patch are, are very rough and very ragged. And uh, by the size of the weeds that are in that crop, you can tell that they were there uh, well before uh, the in-crop herbicide application was made. So it's a, it's a good bet in this case that you're, you've got resistance occurring in that field. The other thing is, is if you've got, especially in the early stages of, of um, uh, herbicide resistance development, if you've got uh, a lot of the plants in that field that were your target uh, controlled and you've got one or two plants that are standing there unaffected uh, with plants right next to them, uh, being killed, then you know uh, that there's a high chance that those ones might be resistant as well. Um, do you have strips in the field that are not really dis distinctive? Uh, they have rough boundaries, and so uh, things like uh, this line here uh, running through the field, uh, kind of following the, the path of the combine. It could be the path of the sprayer, but again, it, it's the odd plant here and there, it's not a, a continuous strip through the field and um, you're getting um, the general pathway but not a very, very specific pathway. Here we go. What you won't see with resistance is these very, very distinct geometric patterns. So the one in the top left there, that is, um, that is actually a uh, plug sprayer nozzle. And so that is something that uh, is very, very distinctive. Uh, the one on the right is where uh, somebody was out patch spraying and they decided to turn the boom off and turn it back on again. And so you'll get very distinct patterns that way. It may, this may even be a check strip that's been left here intentionally, or if you've ever had uh, any research trials out on your farm in the past, they may also have an effect uh, that lasts potentially four or five years. So uh, keep that in mind if you have had uh, folks with research trials out on your land in the past. Look for patterns connected to your combine uh, pathways in the field and you'll know how you approach combining, whether it's end-to-end -end or whether it's uh, in uh, big circles until you get to the middle. Uh, if you see resistance following those pathways uh, or weed misses following those pathways, then you know that there's a high likelihood of resistance in there. Uh, so what does a person do if they think they have a problem? Well, the key is to report suspected problems immediately. Don't wait to get diagnostic services and hope that they go away. Um, oftentimes, later in the year, as time progresses, those problems get harder to diagnose as they blend in with other things that are going on within the crop. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that many herbicide manufacturers now have end dates on any performance claims. And so if you report that problem after that deadline has occurred, uh, then they'll just thank you for buying the product and we'll see you next year. Um, the other thing is if there are corrective measures that can be made and you really uh, don't have much you can do for herbicide injury, but if you have to make another herbicide application to catch weeds that have escaped, uh, potentially if you've got resistance, it may be a case of going in with another her herbicide group and uh, and catching those weeds to make sure that they don't go to seed, uh, or if you have additional fertilizer applications that may need to be made because you're seeing uh, uh, fertilizer deficiency symptoms, then you want to get on those earlier in the season rather than later before they uh, can't be corrected. 
uh, contact your local agronomist, your manufacturer rep, and your regional government specialist or extension person, uh, or all of the above to look at the field. Uh, in Saskatchewan here, we have 10 regional offices with crop specialists at each one. Um, 10 is not a great number for the size of the province, but if it's uh, relatively close to the office, um, the rep may be able to, to come out right away, or they may be able to schedule a visit uh, sometime later after you contact them. So those are always handy eyes to have out there in the field. These field evaluators may need to send samples to a diagnostic lab for further analysis. Um, it's always good to make sure that you have photos of any patterns that you're seeing in the field and include those with any of the submissions that uh, folks send in. Um, they're very helpful for um, trying to filter out some of the things that are going on out in the field. Uh, because when you look at a plant in isolation from what's going on in the field, uh, because you've got lots of overlap and some of those symptoms, uh, it can be difficult without some of that other information to uh, make a diagnostic. Um, if there's drift or misuse suspected, uh, you may need to call in a regulatory inspector and, and I expect that every province will have uh, somebody in that capacity. Um, that's involved with their Pest Control Products Act. If your agronomist or uh, company rep uh, needs to submit samples for diagnosis, um, then there, uh, there are several things that, uh, that you can do. In Saskatchewan here, we have our Crop Protection Laboratory, and oddly enough, we, we get lots of samples from both Alberta and Manitoba as well uh, being sent to our lab for diagnostics. And that's the, the front of the lab there uh, as you pull up uh, from McDonald Street. The goal of our lab and the goal of most other labs is to figure out what's going on basically and try and prevent that problem from happening again in the future. Uh, so really what we're there to do is to provide the, the producer with the information that they need uh, and an explanation as to why something has, has gone wrong in that field. Our current staff at our lab, we have Cecilia Pulala um, as our lab supervisor. She's just recently started with us here in the last couple of months. Uh, Carla Weitzel and Jack, Jackie Shiplack, uh, plant health technicians uh, at the lab, have been there for several years now, so they're quite experienced. And we often also hire a summer student to, to do Dutch elm disease uh, testing and scouting. Uh, on the top left there, that's our lab space. And you can see that there's lots of things going on at any one time in the lab. Uh, we have a herbarium collection at the lab that uh, helps us identify weeds. Uh, we have a growth cabinet uh, in our lab that allows us to grow out samples that uh, may not be at the exact right stage in order to either diagnose or um, to identify so we can uh, grow them out as well. Uh, we've got lots of other tools like microscopes and insect collections uh, that are very similar to the herbarium to help us out with those identifications. It's a user pay service at, at our lab um, and it's based on cost recovery. We just recently had some uh, price changes at the lab. Um, uh, to try and uh, catch up from uh, some of the costs that uh, were occurring at the lab. And so they're outlined here, and they're also outlined on the Saskatchewan Agriculture website uh, for anyone who's interested in uh, getting some diagnostics done. Things that uh, our crop protection lab and many other diagnostic labs don't do uh, is we don't do soil test analysis, and we don't do nutrient status or contamination analysis. Uh, on soils. Uh, those are strictly limited to uh, soils labs like Norwest labs and uh, uh, ALS labs um, uh, that do soil testing specifically. Uh, they will also do um, herbicide residue testing on uh, various either soil samples or plant tissues. Uh, and again, that's not something that our lab or other provincial labs will do. We don't do seed testing. There's lots of seed test labs out there that uh, will do that uh, type of activity. Um, and we don't check for pathogen levels on seed 
uh, that is is trying to be certified uh, for sale as uh, planting seed. Uh, we don't test for toxins in uh, grains and in seeds. Uh, we also uh, can't test for viruses or other non-bacterial uh, or fungal uh, diseases uh, that are out there. Uh, we do, however, uh, if we get these samples into our lab, we will send them off to the labs that are capable of doing that, so we can act as a bit of a um, as a intermediary in that process. Uh, up until recently, we haven't done DNA-based testing, but we are starting uh, specifically for club root uh, here in the next uh, few months. Uh, we're getting our systems up and running, and we're getting our staff trained in order to do. Uh, club root testing through PCR tests. And the other thing we don't do is we don't raise plants from the dead. Um, the, if uh, a sample comes in that has not been uh, packaged all that well and has not been packaged to survive the trip or has been uh, sitting around for too long, oftentimes we can't make a diagnosis on those plants because the features that were there that, that would help us with the diagnosis are no longer present because of the damage that's been done to the sample. So uh, please uh, supply good samples for uh, testing. Again, we're not just trying to identify it, we're trying to figure out why is it there um, and how it can be prevented in the future. Uh, for weed identification, uh, we give the Latin name and the, uh, the common name. Um, generally, the reference that we use for common names is uh, a Canadian government reference uh, called Common and Botanical Names of Weeds in Canada. Um, there are, there may be other common names, and it may not be the common name that's popular in in your area. So that's something to keep in mind when you get a result back on a weed identification. Oftentimes, the plants that we get in for weed identification are not weeds at all, but they are just rare, unusual uh, native plants that uh, have been in the in the soil in the seed bank. Uh, for years and years and years, and for whatever reason, uh, the conditions that are present at that time uh, stimulate those to uh, germinate. Uh, insect identification, very similar. Uh, we do this for not only crops, but we also do it for homes, yards, barns, and animals. Um, it can be a lengthy process uh, depending on the sample. Uh, again, sometimes uh, to get it down to a very specific uh, insect, uh, there needs to be some further analysis by uh, other agencies, and again, we will facilitate uh, that being sent to those other agencies. Um, for disease identification, uh, what we do, and to remember, disease identification also means not only uh, pathogens that are out there, but it also uh, will mean uh, herbicide injury, it will also mean nutrient deficiency symptoms, it will also mean uh, any environmental damage symptoms as well. So those all get included in uh, the disease identification package. The, the testing that we do in that case is, is generally based on visual symptoms that we're seeing on the plants. Um, it can be a very quick process and very quick turnaround process, but if uh, we can't identify it visually, and we need to do uh, some culturing uh, of that plant. It may take a longer period of time. Um, the okay, we'll just skip this. Well, no, this is actually a good slide. We'll we'll stick with this. Uh, sometimes you'll see unusual things happening, like this one on the left here, uh, which is actually a genetic uh, a genetic condition. Uh, there's some uh, genetic damage within that seed and you end up with uh, some type of uh, uncharacteristic display. Uh, again, I talked about uh, herbicide damage is also uh, potentially considered in that disease category as well as some damage that's caused by insects as well. So keep those in mind as well. If we can't identify things visually, we can uh, plate certain things out. Uh, Generally, what will plate out is bacterial and fungal diseases. Uh, viral diseases cannot be plated out because they uh, they won't grow uh, outside of the plant, 
and so those things we need to send off, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, again, culturing can take some time, uh, so be prepared to uh, wait several days uh, at minimum for results from that process. We also do herbicide resistance testing um, at the Crop Protection Lab. Um, we, uh, we use petri dish analysis or assays that require that we have seed and grow that seed out in plates that uh, include the, the test herbicide that we're looking at. Because of weed dormancy, we generally don't start these tests until into January and then that testing continues through the winter months until it's complete, so hopefully by the start of the growing season. Uh, but if we get late samples, that can sometimes continue uh, well into May. And we've had a lot of samples being submitted for herbicide resistance testing over the last two or three years, and that has been the case uh, because of the sheer volume that we've been getting. Uh, we do testing in partnership with uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon. Uh, Dr. Hugh Becky's laboratory, and for anything that we can't do with our petri dish uh, assay testing, uh, Dr. Becky does uh, in his spray cabinet uh, at, in Saskatoon. Um, as I say, we don't start testing until January, uh, so if you submit a sample in the fall, that'll be at least four months for result, could potentially be longer. Uh, we do things on a first-come, first-served basis, so the first samples that we get in get scheduled on the testing list first and get uh, started into the testing process earlier. There are some samples, however, that do require retesting, um, again, because of dormancy and things like that, and so some of those may be delayed longer than uh, even if they were one of the first ones in the door, so keep that in mind as well. So we've got uh, several different systems for um, for herbicide resistance testing. The obvious one is growing out and spraying. Uh, PCR tests can be used for some of the mutations that uh, cause resistance in weeds. Uh, we don't have that capacity at our lab again just yet. We are just starting to get into it for club root and maybe at some point down the road uh, we will be able to get into it but it is a very costly process and so the prices that are in the, the resistance testing right now uh, would have to be increased if a PCR test was required. But what we do is we use the petri dish assay system. Uh, it's a bench top test for uh, herbicide resistance and basically we grow the weed uh, in uh, plates and agar that are treated uh, for uh, or with that herbicide. So it's a fairly laborious process. We have people that have to shuck seeds and poke seeds uh, plate them out on the plates and incubate them and then uh, do the assessments later on. Um, here's a good indicator of what you see when those plates come out. Um, we see uh, a row on the right hand side, number nine, that has very uh, few uh, green tissues coming out of it, whereas the one on the left in the control plate uh, is uh, doing quite well. Uh, here's a a shot of a spray cabinet that uh, is used. Um, Dr. Becky's is uh, quite a bit bigger than this one, but this is another one that's uh, at the University of Saskatchewan that uh, gets used from time to time as well. Uh, seed quality is very important for herbicide resistance testing, and if we look at the the C on the plate here um, in this dish, uh, then you'll note that that means uh, control plate or no herbicide has been added to this plate and you can see this row on the right hand side here um, has not uh, produced any growth at all. Uh, things to keep in mind is if you have uh, herbicide resistance that you and you have seed that you want to test, make sure you collect those seeds before you go in uh, with uh, pre-harvest applications uh, of glyphosate because those will uh, cause uh, viability issues in the seed and it'll uh, cause problems with our, our testing process. This is a, an example of uh, a PCR test and basically what happens is that uh, the genetic material gets uh, increased, isolated, increased, and then run through a gel uh, using electric current 
and you get these patterns breaking out uh, based on the weight of the uh, genes that are in there. And so we can identify uh, resistant types from susceptible types. It's very important when submitting a sample to the lab to make sure that, uh, that a fully completed uh, submission form is sent in with or before uh, the sample um, is sent in. Uh, the completed form is as important as the sample itself in making an accurate diagnosis. Um, and it's unfortunate that if that form is not uh, filled out completely, we oftentimes have to go back to the submitter and get them to uh, collect that information uh, and that delays the diagnostic process. Uh, so if we have completed forms that come in with uh, the samples or as I say ahead of the samples because we do have an online system now for completing those, um, then we can get right to the analysis and oftentimes we can turn that, to, to that diagnostic around in a day. Um, whereas if we're chasing people around to try and get the information, it, it can extend the process uh, quite dramatically. Uh, we have several submission forms now. We used to have just one giant form that was for everything. But what we did is we broke out everything based on weed identification, disease identification, or as I say, plant health diagnosis, herbicide resistance, and insect ID. So now if there is something that is on the form, it's absolutely important to include that on the form. If it's not important, we won't include it on the form. So that's a very important part of uh, submitting a sample to a diagnostic lab is to complete the diagnostic submission form. If you're preparing samples for submission to a lab, uh, these are some, uh, some good practices to uh, adhere to when submitting those samples. If you're sending in a, a plant for identification, make sure that uh, when you collect it, you press it very quickly uh, between a couple of pieces of absorbent paper and put plenty of weight on top of it. Uh, make sure you've got a couple of good rigid surfaces on either side of that, uh, on the outside of that paper and uh, put a fair amount of weight so that you flatten that right down uh, very quickly. Uh, if you do that and then you have good rigid surfaces during shipment, then very little damage happens to that plant and, uh, and make sure it's dry so that we don't get disease development uh, on that sample before it gets to us. For plant disease submissions or as I say, um, uh, injury submissions or uh, any kind of um, what the heck is going on kind of diagnostic. Um, a good way to ship things is to make sure you dig out uh, roots as well as the top part of the plant. Uh, oftentimes we get samples where roots aren't included and it's a dried up little uh, poor little thing and it's very very difficult to really figure out what's going on because what's happening on the top of the plant may not be telling us what is going on. So the more the plant that we can include in that uh, submission, the better. And so the best way to do that is to have some kind of a, uh, a moisture resistant uh, packaging on the roots and then leave the top of the plant uh, outside of that bag. If it's included in the bag, what we get is uh, basically silage by the time it lands uh, in our lab and we really can't do anything with it. So the top growth on the outside of the bag, uh, maybe wrap some moist paper towels around that a little bit or even dry paper towels to protect it a bit and then pack it in a, a fairly uh, hardy package so that it doesn't get uh, wrecked on the way to us. Insect samples, uh, generally what happens with those is that they get uh, included, uh, shipped in alcohol is probably the best way. Um, Insects can be uh, killed either by immersing them in the alcohol or by freezing them first and then putting them in alcohol for uh, transport. Uh, the alcohol does preserve some of the features of the insect and allows them to uh, come to us in, in good shape. Um, if you have insects that are pressed like plants, they aren't very easily identified. So. Uh, the insect itself needs to be in a fairly rigid container before it gets put into the shipping package. No live insects, please. Uh, our uh, folks get kind of skittish when things start jumping out of packages uh, before we can uh, get them identified. 
herbicide resistance uh, submissions, we want mature, healthy seed. And as I say, um, before any pre-harvest applications are made, collect the seeds from those patches that you suspect are resistant, and then dry them thoroughly. Remember, we need 1,000 seeds per group or subgroup that's being tested. Um, again, there can't be too many seeds. There can be too few seeds because if we have to continually retest some of those samples, then we oftentimes run out of seed and then we get a zero result. And that can be not only frustrating for us, but also frustrating for the farmer. Uh, again, make sure that they air dry. Um, keep the seeds in paper bags are the best way to uh, dry them out, um, oftentimes with the tops open. So a paper bag with the square bottom, the seeds inside, and just open to the air uh, so that they, they dry nicely. Um, fungus infected seeds uh, really don't go through the testing process uh, all that well because when we're growing out these seeds, we actually grow them on uh, a watered down version of the agar that we uh, use for disease testing. And so any, uh, any disease organisms that happen to be on that seed when it comes to us just get amplified when we go through the testing process. So make sure that they're, they're good and dry and they're not developing any mold. Um, plastic bags are good for short term shipment, uh, but again paper bags are preferred and they should be shipped in cardboard, uh, rigid cardboard containers so that we don't have spills on the way uh, from the, your location to ours. Uh, please indicate on the submission form the closest town to the field uh, that's the, at issue. And what that does is that that helps us uh, figure out what our distribution of resistance is in, the, in uh, Western Canada. Um, what we've got so far for submissions, because a lot of reps come from uh, the major centers in town, a lot of our resistance seems to be focused around the major centers in the province uh, or in Western Canada as well. So keep that in mind and, and note the town closest to the field itself. Uh, to sum all that up, uh, information, information, information. The more information you can provide on uh, what's happening in that field, uh, the better odds there are for us to uh, give a good, accurate diagnosis and allow you to understand uh, what's happening in your field. Um, if there's herbicide injury suspected, then make sure you send in some weeds as well because they'll also give us clues as to what's uh, going on in that field. Um, make sure you package the sample well for delivery uh, so that it gets to us in good shape and hopefully that happens uh, in a short period of time from the time the sample is taken in the field to the time that it gets to us. The shorter that time frame is, the better. And again, this, no sample can be too large. Oftentimes we'll get uh, samples for uh, injury or disease diagnosis that uh, the person sends in one small little plant and hopes that we can figure out from that uh, what's going on. Send in many plants. Uh, select the whole row, um, make sure you include roots, make sure you include the top growth, um, and again, any weeds that are around it will help us uh, diagnose these things accurately as well. Well, thank you for listening in today. I appreciate your attention. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on the count there, and it really hasn't varied a whole lot, so thank you very much for your patience. And uh, if you have any questions uh, after Darren has uh, done a little bit of a synopsis, then I'll be around for that as well. Well, thank you very much, Clark. Lots of great tips in there. Um, I will, uh, um, just before we get into the, uh, the Q&A, um, I know a few people on here are likely waiting for this code, so uh, in keeping with the theme of evaluating uh, after your herbicide applications, the job that you've done after the spray is the code for, for both CCAs. Uh, we've qualified for one integrated pest management uh, credit, uh, CEU credit for the uh, CCA program and the CCSC program. So uh, jot this code down now and then after the webinar is over you can go to 
uh, our link on to the, to this uh, link, the webinar page on our our uh, uh, website, and uh, there will be a link available there that you can submit your information uh, so that we can get you on the list for that. Um, if anyone has any questions, by all means, uh, type them into the in and uh, submit them. Uh, right now, we don't seem to have too many. I know it's a busy season, so lots of people likely eager to uh, get out and do some scouting. Uh, but one question I just had, Clark. Uh, um, uh, often with the herbicide efficacy, uh, we tend to be focused on uh, the actual application process and the conditions under which we're applying and, and crop stage in terms of trying to maximize that efficacy. But obviously, uh, from a systems approach, there, there are some cultural things that can be done. I know lots of work with different crops on uh, things like the, the plant density of the crop and, and how that competes with weeds and, and can help with your overall weed control. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to get any comments you might have in terms of cultural practices that uh, you might recommend to uh, kind of work with the herbicides that you're using to help improve that overall weed control, anything that you might single out there, and uh, the flip side, I guess, anything that might contribute more to, to a quicker uh, buildup of uh, resistant populations. Uh, thanks, Jeroen. Uh, it's a good question. Um, oftentimes, a I feel that we rely very heavily on herbicides to uh, to uh, control weeds, and oftentimes our systems are built around that. Um, the assumption that those herbicides are are going to be uh, flawless every time, and so as a result, we put an awful lot of stress on uh, our herbicides to uh, keep weeds under control in the absence of other. Uh, other mechanisms that we might have for uh, for that that effect. Um, I think one of the key things uh, that's that's really easy for people to implement right off the bat is to uh, do all those things that you would do to make to maximize the health of your crop. Uh, good healthy crops uh, compete against weeds uh, very effectively, and if we have uh, situations where um, the weed is is maybe deficient in fertilizer or maybe has been seeded on the deep side um, and has as a result the weeds have come from an inch deep and the crop has come from three inches deep in the say in the case of cereals um, that that crop is now behind the eight ball uh, with respect to uh, the health uh, of the crop versus the health of the weed. Weeds being weeds are very good at scavenging uh, limited resources, but our crops, because they're domesticated, uh, have uh, been bred to be very reliant on uh, inputs and, and being, uh, being managed very effectively. Um, one of the things that, that we think about when we're making big investments in uh, machinery is uh, how efficiently they'll make their way through the field and sometimes those engineering priorities conflict with weed control priorities and so as we widen our row spacing uh, to reduce drag and to increase efficiency through the field then we end up with situations where we're putting more and more stress on our herbicides to uh, control those weeds. So row spacing is one thing in that 8 to 10 inch range is, is probably optimum. I don't think any narrower than that provides us with any benefit, but uh, wider than that does cause us some problems. Um, high populations, I know that, uh, that uh, canola seed is very expensive and uh, we all uh, talk about how uh, canola is very good at recovering if you've, you've had uh, emergence issues or you've had um, some catastrophic event uh, befall the crop, uh, but we don't really want to put that crop at the point of the tipping point before you've had one of those catastrophic failures uh, or you've had emergence challenges. Uh, you want to make sure that you're, you're looking at, uh, at an optimum seeding rate uh, right off the bat, and then you've got that buffer built in for 
uh, things like weed control, for things like um, uh, needing to reseed after some uh, catastrophic event and things like that. So those are some key things. Um, producers should be for, um, should be soil testing for fertility and uh, and fertilizing to that soil test recommendation. Um, the considering the the low cost of that test versus the high cost of fertilizer that uh, producers are incurring now um, makes that test more and more valuable as time goes on so that they're not only uh, not over fertilizing but they're not under fertilizing and they're maximizing uh, the return on their crop as a result. So those are those are some things that uh, producers can do um, that are they're really not um, they're really not overly uh, outside of what their normal practice would be, but it's a little bit of attention to detail that that uh, will go a long way to help uh, preventing resistance and uh, and maximizing uh, the utility of their herbicides. Great comments, Clark, and uh, in particular, I know the the row spacing one is a question we get more and more from. Uh, is there any potential impact on the yield of canola going to those wider spacings and and often the data tends to suggest that there isn't a lot of penalty to the wider row, say, row spacing but I think that that happens because our herbicide systems are pretty effective at managing those weeds but there there may be some issues in the long run uh, in in a system with a wider row spacing so that that was one in particular that I'm glad you mentioned yeah um, exactly as far as uh, there's been a couple more questions come in, uh, in particular with regard to lambs quarters, and uh, so uh, uh, Brian asked the question. Uh, they've had uh, some difficulty controlling it with the contact products like Liberty. Um, uh, the growers he's been dealing with were mostly using good water volumes, and uh, typically the air induction nozzle with kind of a medium droplet size um, sprayed during the the daytime. Uh, so he was wondering if you had any other suggestions for things that might help improve efficacy with regard to lamb school. Um, well, one of the things that, that may be going on this year is that because we've had uh, fairly cool, cloudy conditions, a lot of our uh, herbicides have been fairly slow to, to act this year. Um, the size of the plant for um, for a contact herbicide is critically important and one of the things that we're they're seeing in the US even with with glyphosate resistance is that it's there's a mechanism there that's actually turning glyphosate into a contact herbicide and what they're doing is they're seeing that, that the leaves are being uh, burnt off but the plant comes back from growing points and oftentimes that's uh, what happens with those contact herbicides is that if your plant gets to the point where it's starting to bolt, um, it's got more resources in the stem, it's got more resources in the root, and it's got those lateral buds on the stem uh, to regrow re uh, the leaves from uh, following that, that contact herbicide application. And, uh, and as a result, uh, your weed recovers. And it doesn't have to be very far into that elongation stage before uh, it has that capacity to recover from that contact herbicide. Great. And uh, one further question, and this one uh, is a question about uh, is are, have there been any observations of resistant lambs quarter uh, f with regard to edge granular, or is it just a question of application timing, fall versus spring? So. This is a different question that I haven't seen for a while. Yeah, uh, I haven't heard of any uh, resistance lambs quarters uh, showing up, uh, particularly in in the prairies. Um, there may be situations around the world that that may have occurred, but I don't believe so. Uh, that group of herbicides. Uh, from a worldwide perspective is a very robust chemistry uh, with respect to it has very low number of weeds that have developed resistance to it and so as a result we 
often uh, suspect uh, the way that, that that herbicide has been implemented as the, the cause of some of the problems, particularly with broadleaf weeds. Uh, there was a grad student, uh, well, just about 20 years ago now that um, was at the U of S while I was working there, uh, who looked into uh, different incorporation um, intensities and how various weeds responded to that incorporation. And really the message that came out of that research was that um, the less incorporation that is done, uh, the less effective that the edge is going to be on broadleaf weeds. And uh, it was amazing how uh, how much incorporation it actually took to get really uh, excellent activity on uh, broadleaf weeds. Grass weeds with edge are, are a lot more forgiving uh, as far as um, how much incorporation gets done and will actually do quite well uh, without incorporation. Uh, fall application is going to be much more effective than spring application as a general rule. Just because that winter freeze-thaw cycle allows the granules uh, that it is formulated into break down and then if you can do a little bit of uh, stirring of the surface uh, first thing in the spring and get that distribution spread out a little bit further then you've got a better barrier that uh, is there for those weeds that are coming through. The Go ahead. Uh, no, that's okay. Okay. Um, one of the things that I was going to say is that um, those the herbicides in that family have quite a challenge with um, direct seeding in that um, they're all very volatile. They're all very sensitive to light and with spring application both of those situations are exacerbated because in the spring your soil temperatures um, are going to warm up because you've got longer day lengths and you've got higher light conditions that are occurring at the soil surface at the spring uh, timing. Whereas if you can go in in the fall and your stubble uh, collapses over the winter on top of that granule, um, then you protect those granules to a certain degree from uh, some of those environmental conditions that uh, they might experience in the spring. Great tips. And just uh, one last question before we wrap up the Q&A and uh, finish off the webinar. Uh, is field horsetail glyphosate resistant? Not that, that we, not the way that we understand resistance. Um, Field horsetail has never been very well controlled by glyphosate and really the challenge that we have with uh, the horsetail species and that not only includes field horsetail itself but it also includes uh, a similar species called scouring rush. Um, the folks that have green pencils sticking up in their field, that's scouring rush and if it's got uh, the sort of um, lacy uh, leaf-like uh, uh, structures to it, then that's uh, considered to be horsetail. But both of them are very sensitive uh, to contact injury from herbicides that are applied to it. So if, if the adjuvant system in that herbicide is harsh in any way, uh, then the top, top growth is killed off very quickly uh, with that species. And the real challenge is, is that it's very much what I would refer to as an iceberg plant in that 90% of your your plant biomass is actually underground with that, that plant. Uh, so the way to approach management of that, that species is to focus on the, uh, the area uh, where it gets initiated. It's, it's a very ancient um, plant family, it's in the ferns, and the ferns don't produce seeds, they produce spores. And one of the things that has to happen with horsetail in particular and, and things in the horsetail family is that those spores need to sit in standing water or saturated soil uh, for a 24 hour period before they can actually germinate and start a new colony. Uh, by far and large, most of the new growth that occurs with horsetails comes from the roots 
and comes from the creeping of those roots out of that low area where it got initiated. And so I refer to that lower area as kind of the mother colony. And then you will get roots and plants spreading up out of that, that low area where it got initiated uh, up into some of the upland area around that low spot. If you focus um, herbicide activity on that, that low area and, and really the only uh, product that, that has um, good long-term activity on that root uh, at this point uh, is Amitrol. And Amitrol is the only, the only thing outside of MCPAK for top growth control uh, of horsetail. It's the only thing really registered for horse sale control. But the, the, because it's going to be a fairly expensive operation, you want to focus that, that investment on that, that mother colony down in the low area. And then where you've got spread up into those upland areas, there has been some uh, research done at the Scott Research Farm uh, showing that uh, the tri, tri, or thiphon sulfuron tribenuron mixes, so things like refined, um, and, and the other ones uh, that include thiophen sulfur on, uh, mixed with some MCPA, uh, preferably an amine again to try and minimize the impact of the adjuvant on that, uh, on that top growth, uh, does provide some pretty decent control, uh, particularly through that season uh, for cereal crop. And outside of that, we really don't have a lot of good options for horse tail management. All right, great. Well, I think that wraps up our questions, Clark. Just want to say thanks for uh, helping us out with the webinar today. Really appreciate you sharing uh, your expertise. Clark's been a, a specialist that, that's provided lots of good input for our weekly Canola Watch reports as well. And uh, so we'll just pull up the screen here um, uh, and, and thank Clark again uh, for, for his participation today. Uh, this is just a reminder, if you're not signed up to our, our Canola Watch distribution list, uh, you can go to canolawatch.org and get signed up. And all of the invitations to our webinar series go out through that distribution network as well. So uh, if you're not signed up, uh, by all means, uh, and if you know others that might be interested in getting the invitations to these webinars, uh, you can share the canolawatch.org uh, uh, web address with them. So with that, uh, we'll wrap things up and thanks again, Clark. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it.